Hey everybody, Adam Savage, and I am in the Mary Baker hangar at Udvar Hazi with conservator Kate Gabrielli. Kate, tell me what this beautiful object is. So we're looking at a countdown clock from the NASA VIP area at the um, John F. Kennedy Space Center. So this was the countdown clock for which, for, for the shuttle? For the shuttle program during the 80s and 90s. Oh my, so this is the countdown clock that the VIPs would have been watching for any given shuttle launch during the 80s and 90s. That's the idea. What an icon. It is a simple set of seven segment displays. That's right. So it would have uh, functioned as little flat boards that displays the countdown. So mm -hmm. your iconic T minus. 10 seconds, let's say, um, yeah. and that's how we'd like to display it. And is, they'd be um, clicking down mm -hmm, yeah. audibly, making, I would imagine, a fair bit of noise. You can kind of hear it, can't you? <laughs> so this was um, after its use life stored in um, not so ideal conditions in a barn <laughs> with the salty air and everything down in Florida. So um, After it was decommissioned, after it, was it then decommissioned. lived in a barn getting abused. That's the story, okay. and, and you could kind of see that after we took the vitrine down. Um, you could get a sense of some of the condition issues and um, the, there were little critters that had taken up residence and, oh, wow. and um, expired. So, um, so part of the of treatment- So lots of dead things, <laughs> lots of dead things. Oh my God. Was vacuuming up the dead things. That was um, an unpleasant aspect of all of this. Um, so when you're doing something like that and this arrives and I'm assuming you pull the glass off and you're disgusted by what is underneath, do you then- go through a process of dismantling, taking all the displays out and taking this whole thing apart as much as you can? It kind of depends on what is needed. We, we want to keep everything where it is placed as right. much as possible, but if there's a corrosion issue behind a structure, you might want to remove that as right. gently as possible. Uh, how do you go about testing and seeing what the, how that corrosion is working? In as much as we can tell um, from the morph morphology and the chemical identity of the material, mm -hmm. um, we can make treatment decisions. So we have a few tools at our disposal, um, which include um, FTIR, what which is, is Fourier Transform Infrared Spectroscopy. Okay. And um, that comes in the form of that portable instrument over there. We can oh. walk over and look at that. Okay, and this can help tell you what a material is how does it do that? Yes, so it um, uses infrared radiation yeah. to um, pass through a very thin layer of a sample that you put on this cell. Ah, okay. And that sample, uh, the sample cell is a diamond because it has a high refractive index mm -hmm. without going into that. Suffice it to say that the infrared radiation is sensitive to both um, organics, primarily organics, and some inorganics. So salts and, and corrosion products and the like. Okay. Um, it's really driven by um, library comparison. Okay. So um, you'll see a bunch of peaks here. A readout looks like this. It knows the graphs of many, many materials and tells you which one yours matches? Yes. Okay. So each material and material mixture will have a fingerprint in the form of a spectrum like this. Okay. So the red sample here was mm -hmm, from, mm -hmm. the, from the clock and the blue is the library match. Ah, so you'll okay. see that that reads out as adipic acid. That's not something I have in my brain. Right. So we relied on the computer to make that match. And luckily there was a, a match in the library. Oh, so there very much could be a case in which you take a reading and it's a mystery material. Oh, almost always. Oh. <laughs> Fair. So this, this was fortuitous sort of in the sense that we had a library match and we also have um, a, a fellow who is investigating um, this particular plasticizer and its migration out of polyurethane coating on textile. Wow. Can you then take that paint and make a library match for it so other people know how to test for that paint and know where to look for that plasticizer? Yeah, that is in fact a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then this is another thing that does something similar. Similar, and this is active uh -huh. um, against elemental signatures in your sample. It is particularly useful for metals and does, paint analysis. Does this use a laser or something like that to it, do that? It uses x-rays. Oh, right, okay. So um, there's an x-ray tube inside of the instrument that generates x-rays and um, yeah, just like your, your phaser gun. So we, do you guys uh, wear lead aprons as you're pointing this around? It's, it's not quite <laughs> str as strong as that. We Fair. do, um, are, we are directed to stand two meters away from the gun while it's in operation. So Fair. 
this, um, it's useful that this can be operated remotely um, with a laptop as well. So you put your sample on here. Um, gotcha. It's really quite sensitive and it only needs to be run for about 10 seconds. In this case, we tend to exploit chemical differences in between the material you want to remove and the material you want to remain. So the pH of the plasticizer material was very low. It was quite acidic, okay. um, which on the one hand suggests that it, ha it should be removed because it's possibly damaging sure. to the surface. And on the other hand, that is a difference in between the uh, foreign or the um, migrating material right. and the material that we want to remain. So I was able to remove it with water that was pH adjusted into the to more, more base. acidic oh, I category. See. Um, so then it pulls it with it. It pulls it with oh, it. So like dissolves like. Fabulous. Uh, do you then share that information with other museums or do you, you obviously you log that for your guys' own records about the history of this object, but that's a fascinating treatment so that you don't have to strip it and it, the paint can remain as original as possible. Yes, so um, that information was in interesting on a sort of historic material sense. Yeah. And also in case someone encounters the same condition later down the line. Um, we have kind of a joke about what is that white stuff? Because yeah. it's always um, kind of, you know, it's white and it's crystalline. That's not diagnostically very interesting. Right. But in fact, in this very own collection, uh, this very same collection, we've had a similar condition issue with the same plasticizer material migrating out um, of a polyurethane coating material. So um, the more we try and air different treatments, the more we can apply those to, to similar materials in our same collection. Oh my goodness. May, are these activatable? Can I touch one? Yes, please. So okay. they're um, spring loaded. Oh wow, there they're so go. light. Yeah. How are the condition of these front facing? This is a beautiful fluorescent yellow paint job. Yeah, so they were really pretty grimy. So that was the yeah. other challenge was okay. um, access into these little nooks and crannies. Um, and how do you go about cleaning those? That strikes me as a, an exhaustive process. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not quite done. You'll see there, there's still there's some, some that are soiling staying. remaining. Um, it was just run of the mill environmental dust and dirt. So right. it, it was a pH adjusted water treatment as well. Gotcha. Um, to remove uh, the maximum amount of soiling with the minim minimum amount of mechanical intervention. Gotcha. Oh man, you guys are always balancing so many <laughs> things to achieve. I love mechanical displays. Uh, I grew up in New York where Grand Central Station yes. had these cascading yes. <laughs> displays that are just like part of my being. And the very first time I uh, uh, start, bought a 3D printer, one of the very first things I made was a seven segment display. <laughs> I just find them, their operation really magical. Yes. Well, and this one would have, with the fluorescent paint job that you noticed, um, it would have been lit by a black light that's up here oh, um, this is a to make it light and bright so that it's visible. Um, this is not operational anymore, but it is still in pretty good condition. So you guys will will just, not permanently, but you will affix all of these to, to get your... Uh, to get your displays to where you want the, what numbers you want to see. Yes, so um, I've trialed a, a little carved ah, insert here. Yes, I see a little um, bit of ethafoam. And all that takes is, is just a little bit of pressure mounting. It'll stay in place when this, this clock will be displayed yeah. with the, the base down on the, on the display deck. And so, so that um, pressure means that it's not applying too much stress and it's not a glue and it's not mechanical. So you don't have correct, to change the form correct. at all. There's your mechanical fitting for you. Yes. And <laughs> it'll be in black foam so it's not visible. I love it. Uh, and then you guys will put the glass back on. The glass obviously easy to clean. Oh my goodness. Kate, thank you so much for walking me through this. It's just really, and what, it, what an incredible piece of history. I mean, uh, I've been in a room during a launch and I've, mm -hmm felt that energy. Yeah. Um, this has been witness to so much of that beautiful <laughs> energy, right? Yes. Well, thank you so much. I really thank appreciate you. It. <laughs>